Yeah, I guess we're ready to start. Uh, I will not introduce the speakers because the biography is on the screen. So, uh, for the sake of time, uh, Dr. Sroor, Dr. Azzi, thank you so much for your time, for offering your time to educate us more about GDP. Uh, we're all interested in this topic. It's a hot topic these days, and uh, we, I, I, I believe, we know maybe one percent of what of the potential of uh, chat GPT. So, please educate us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you all for attending uh, our event. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm Jordan Struhr, and in case we look too much alike and you didn't know who is who, I'm Jordan Struhr, uh, Assistant Provost of uh, Educational Resources and Innovation here at LAU. And thank you for coming, and welcome home. Right, You're all alumni, so every time you come on campus, I hope you feel like it's your home and that you're um, happy to be back. So yes, we're going to be talking about ChatGPT. It's kind of what everyone's talking about these days, so we're just adding our voices to the mix. Um, and we want to actually start with your voice. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of interactivity here. We have a poll. So to access this poll, what you need to do is open your smartphone. I hope it's Wi-Fi enabled. Um, go to pollev.com. That's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash my name, Jordan Sroor, J-O-R-D-A-N-S-R-O-U-R. -R -R, 284. Once you're there, you will see this uh, screen and you will be able to answer our question. So the question is, which statement best describes your reaction when somebody says ChatGPT? Um, so option one, ChatGPT is amazing, I did the coolest thing with it yesterday. Or ChatGPT is the end of humanity. Or ChatGPT, what's that? Um, so go ahead, place your votes. Um, have three, three votes, four votes. Yeah, wait a few moments. This same um, polling software will come back in the presentation, so good if you get a little practice with it now. Wait, just a. results. Lucky number 13. I'll go ahead. Don't worry, there'll be other opportunities to, to vote in the presentation. So if you feel you missed your chance, um, you can still vote. Oh, wow. Okay. So we do have a little bit of a mix. Um, I see that our audience is uh, from primarily technology enthusiasts, so that's good to hear. Um, but yeah, ChatGPT does strike a little bit of fear into some of our hearts, end of humanity. Uh, we could sympathize with that. And um, what's that? Well, if you don't know, by the end of tonight's presentation, hopefully you know what ChatGPT is and you'll walk away with a little bit of knowledge. So thank you for, for voting. Let's, uh, there's the votes again. So let's go, go ahead and dig kind of more into that, that middle question, the end of humanity. Well, what does it mean to be human? Um, so this is a, a nice quote from, from Arizona State University. They have a nice uh, page where children can write in questions and ask a biologist. So uh, the question was, what is it uh, to be human? Some people think that the main differences between humans and other animal species is our ability for complex reasoning or use of complex language or our ability to solve difficult problems and introspection, right? the reflecting of our own thoughts and feelings. So let's look at ChatGPT and whether it's able to assume some of those human characteristics. So I, I fed it in um, a problem for complex reasoning. Now this was it's a pretty dumb riddle, I'll be honest. It was kind of the first riddle that came to my mind. Um, the riddle is, a man who lives in a 30-story building decides to jump out of a window. He survives the fall with no injuries. How did that happen? Okay, so you've all gotten it, you must be human, but apparently ChatGPT can think that way too. So the man jumped out of a ground floor window of the 30-story uh, building rather than from one of the upper floors, etc. Okay, let's check the next thing, complex language. So the first thing that came to my mind here, I am actually a, a mathematician and an engineer, so I had to really dig back all the way to AP, AP English in high school and remember my favorite Shakespeare play, Measure for Measure. So I asked it, 
in Shakespeare's play, Measure for Measure, the Duke proposes to Isabella two times, yet in each time his proposal is met with silence. Nevertheless, upon closer reading, both proposals are more like assertions or even commands rather than questions. Do you think that it is, in, it is this phrasing which leads to her silent response? Chat GPT, it's possible that the Duke's phrasing contributed to Isabella's silence in response to his proposals in both instances, da, 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 and then it goes on, however, so it's giving me an answer on the other side of the coin. Is that complex language? I'm not sure one could argue that all night. We don't have all night. Let's go to the next thing. Difficult problems. Now, I'll be honest, this is not such a difficult problem, but it looks difficult, right? Um, it's from differential geometry, and it's basically just uh, a projection from one um, uh, manifold to the next. So we have a stereographic pro projection. And the question is to, here's uh, theta equals zero, psi is arbitrary, find x1 and x2. So it's really just replacement. But then the last part, give a geometric interpretation. Let's see if ChatGPT can do this. Yes, it can. And it even gives at the end, uh, geometrically, this means that the north pole of the unit sphere R3 is mapped to the origin in R2 under the stereographic projection, etc. So it even gives an, an interpretation. Okay. So far, ChatGPT is doing pretty well at stealing our human jobs. Uh, when we have one left, introspection. So here's what I did. I got clever and I asked ChatGPT, what is your favorite childhood memory and why? And I get back, as an artificial intelligence language model, I don't have the capacity to form memories or have personal experiences like humans do, so I don't have a favorite childhood memory. My purpose is to assist you with information, answer questions, and provide guidance to the best of my abilities. Is there anything else I can assist you with? Now, this is kind of a really ironic answer because the very fact that it can start out as an artificial intelligence language model, that's a form of introspection, folks, right? And then it goes on and it uses anthropomorphizing language, right? I and me and you and I don't have a childhood memory. Oh my. So, mm, I don't know. I like to believe it failed on this, but we'll see. So. Before we get too discouraged, I will turn it over to Red, who can save the day for us. All right. Um, so it's ironic that Jordan is saying, before we get too discouraged, and then my next slide looks something like this. So um, fear not, ChatGPT is coming for your jobs. I mean, at the end of the day, this is the sort of moral panic that has <laughs> taken over our lives since November, at least for most of us who weren't very aware of what was happening prior to that, because it only came into public view in November, and that's when the moral panic erupted. Now, as someone who dealt with panic during lockdown, who had to transition to online education super quickly, and who was one of the lucky few who had the privilege of at least knowing a little bit about online education before that, I did not want the same thing to happen. I didn't want that same moral panic to take over my life, and I didn't want to feel that my work and my life's purpose is so insignificant that it could be turned around in just such a tiny moment in time. So this is why, yes, it's true, ChatGPT will take over some jobs. I mean, there are even jobs that we didn't think would be taken over. Now there are people who say even they would prefer a nurse that is built upon artificial intelligence rather than a human nurse, because at least they'd be sure that it would follow protocols all the way. You know, so even jobs that we've traditionally considered safe aren't safe anymore. There's also a quote I remember reading that we used to think artificial intelligence will do the boring parts of our lives so we can write music and be creative. Now it feels like ChatGPT can write music and paint, not just ChatGPT, but all the AI you know, software out there, while we're probably going to be flipping burgers at McDonald's. <laughs> so it's true that things are not as simple as they might appear, and it's true that some jobs are at risk, but it's also true that some jobs are currently being developed. 
with any major innovation, we talk about jobs being lost, but also jobs being created. So now you have something, maybe this is my dream job for the future, being an AI whisperer. I think I have the, you know, the right set of skills for that. So this is apparently someone who does not know coding, check. Doesn't do math, check. I failed math, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, so I think I, I've got this. I think this is something for my retirement. But what I'm trying to say here is that there are jobs that we can work for, and this is only the beginning, okay? Now, of course, when we talk about all of these different jobs and this sort of panic, this is where the debate, for example, in my line of work, I mean, you're here at your academic institution, and when it comes to academics, we've always felt like we are just told about all of these innovations and asked to deal with it. It's like, here's ChatGPT, your students will use it to cheat, deal with it. And this kind of panic has created very extreme responses with some universities saying, oh, we're banning it. I get students every day coming into the classroom saying, Dr. Elsie, do you know they banned it in England? In England! say, okay, all right, great, good for them. <laughs> but the idea is that while some institutions are going for banning, others are going for embracing. And where is that balancing act? And where's that middle point? Now, this is something that we've been doing in our classes, and it is embracing. But embracing with consciousness. Like these, for example, are 20 ways in which you can use ChatGPT in the classroom. And I think, <laughs> I think I've done maybe at least 10 or 15 of those different strategies from the beginning of the spring semester till now, okay? So it's been about eight weeks of having fun with ChatGPT. But not only that, so what we're currently doing is actually researching how we can use this kind of program across the spectrum, liberal arts, liberal sciences, all sorts of different courses, and how we can integrate. But the point behind this is not to be naive. I mean, only today I heard a teacher saying, how can you let them? Let them. As if at any point in time, I have been given any sense of control, okay? But the idea is that, can I take back some control? Can I, as a teacher, use AI critically with awareness, with consciousness in my class. This has been dropped into my lap and I can either just hide, just as we've done before with all sorts of other technology, or I can say, all right, come, come at me. What do you want? Let me see how I can deal with it. So what we've done, and this is part of the sort of strategy of embracing, is asking ourselves, okay, so in this particular exercise in this classroom, what is my goal? Do I really want them to memorize 19th century, century England and all the problems they had? Do I? No, that's not my goal. My goal is to teach them something else. So how about they use ChatGPT to get that part out of the way? And now we can look at beautiful, dark poems by William Blake from the Songs of Innocence and Experience and really ruin them and really make these students want therapy at some point in their lives. You know, I mean, that's, I'm sorry, no, that's not my ultimate purpose. Sorry, assistant provost. Okay, <laughs> so to come back. So the idea is how can I use ChatGPT or other forms of AI to support my students' learning journey and to also support my teaching journey? So this is an example, for example, from a literature class. Um, so the point was within class for students to use ChatGPT uh, in order for them to write a poem. Not any poem, a sonnet based on William Shakespeare's poetic style. They had to follow iambic pentameter. They had to follow all of the structures that made Shakespeare's sonnets very unique. But at the same time, they had to do it with their own awareness of the elements of poetry they wanted to have. And I wanted to share this with you because as people coming back to their, um, you know, university, so what my students had, this is an example for instance, and my students actually credited OpenAI with helping them write this. They did this within one class session, okay? So within the class session, they decided that this is going to be their prompt. By the way, please notice how detailed the prompt is. So write a Shakespeare style sonnet with a theme of love taken for granted and is approaching its end. The sonnet should be about a 57-year-old university building named Orm Gray, for all the LAU students in the room. Uh, named Orm Gray, where all the university presidents... Oh, the sound isn't great, there's a slight echo. Is the sound better now for WebEx people? Okay. <laughs> all right, so... Um, 
as well as the house of many computer science students, filled with good and bad memories where friends were made and bonds broken, housing a memorabilia gallery, do pass by, by the way, whenever you can, it's good to keep some memories of LAU, uh, exposed to all passers-by who rush through without stopping to look at the trinkets of the university's history until their time is up. Please include the following words. So this was the prompt. Are you ready to see the sonnet? Shakespeare style. Okay. Here we go. Orm Gray, a home to many, a home to all. A home to memories, both good and bad. A home to nocturnal studies, when friends did call. A home to the university's presidents, present and past. But now, a new life awaits the old gray stone. A life of passers-by, not friends, just a few. A life of trinkets, forgotten and alone. A life of memories that never made it through. Oh, warm gray, how you were taken for granted. And now, memories of you will soon be gone. The passage of time had its toll and planted a seed of sadness, yet still a lingering song. But I will still remember, if just for one day, the stories of joy which in you did lay. Now, you might look at this and say, oh wow, so our creativity is at an end, where is humanity, we will never write poetry again. My students were upset, because they realized that in previous semesters, it was the students who used to write the poem and actually work on it and actually re really try hard to get the rhyme done, they were upset that it was done for them. Actually, this particular pair of students decided to revise some of the lines in the poem because they didn't like what ChatGPT gave them. And after negotiating three, four times, they still didn't like it, so they did it manually. Okay? So, again, what am I standing here and saying? I'm not really sure. Most of us don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> but what I'm standing here and saying is that it's not the end of humanity as we know it. It is a tool, and as long as we continue to think of it as a tool, which I hope is something that will be a carrying, you know, sort of like an ongoing through line in today's session, as long as we keep thinking of it as a tool, we think of ways that we can use the tool rather than the other way around. Okay? Now, we're going to move to the next section where Dr. Sroor is going to tell us all about how it works and you know how we get to do something like what my students got to do in their literature class. Thank you. Amazing. Am I on? I tell you it's on. Let's see if I'm really on. It should be on. Well. Okay, there I'm on. Uh, excellent. Thank you. So yes, indeed, ChatGPT is a tool. Um, there, so our online people can hear us. Uh, great. Uh, just before I proceed to tell you how it works, I want to point out that the images here um, were created by Dali, which is also a product of OpenAI, um, which is an AI-enabled uh, image generator. You put in a prompt, um, and I, my prompt for this image was uh, old fashioned inside of an old-fashioned typewriter. Um, done in a, uh, I think, a print style, something like that, and this is what I got back. Um, so, yeah. How does it work, though? So it is just a tool, and as I am always trying to remind my son, we control computers, computers do not control us. So the way into that is to understand how they work so you know how to control them. So first of all, some basic vocabulary. Um, the term artificial intelligence is out there, it's all over, you hear it a lot. Um, what is it? Artificial intelligence is really just that um, act of creating a machine, analog or digital, that reflects intelligent behavior. Now we could, again, debate all night what is intelligent behavior, and there's many different ideas about that, and we have concepts of weak um, and strong intelligence. But that's the overarching uh, broader category. Within artificial intelligence, there are certain digital tools, uh, machine learning based algorithms that exhibit that uh, behavior. So the idea of machine learning is that it's an algorithm that can take in data and produce a model. And that model largely will predict something, either the next word, the next phrase, whatever um, needs to be predicted based on the input. So those are machine learning tools. Within machine learning tools, you'll hear sometimes the phrase net neural networks. Neural networks are a type of machine learning. And within neural networks, there are many types of neural networks. Um, within that, we have the concept of deep learning. So these are all terms you might hear when you read the newspapers, uh, media reports about um, chat GPT. So now hopefully you have a, a basic understanding of, of that vocabulary. Um, 
going to go a little bit deeper. I, I don't know if anyone in this room are computer science alumni um, or, or what uh, your backgrounds are per se. So this is the uh, sort of geeky, more detailed answer, and then I'm going to break this down for you. So GPT, first of all, stands for Generative Pre-Training, and it is a transformer-based architecture, which is actually pretty cool because it follows a two-stage procedure. The first stage it takes in a mother load of data and goes through an unsupervised learning strategy. Um, so a language modeling objective is used on the unlabeled data, so this is you know, wild found data, to learn the initial parameters of a neural network. So it takes in the raw data without any intervention and trains the neural network. Subsequently, the parameters are adapted to a target task using the corresponding supervised machine learning objective. So there's an unsupervised and supervised part. Now if that, if I lost you already, don't worry. We're gonna make it fun through some games that hopefully then you'll at least get a sense of what's going on. So first game, sort the books. Here's what it is. I have a stack of books here. Um, and now I'm gonna make a shameless plug for the LAU libraries as alumni. You are uh, most welcome in the LAU libraries. These are all checked out from the LAU libraries. Um, and uh, you can also check out materials for a small deposit of $50. You're welcome to check out any materials you'd like from the LAU libraries. If you are not an LAU alumni, another small advertisement, we have an unaffiliated subscription and you can subscribe to the libraries and come in and use our resources at the LAU libraries. Okay, now that my shameless advertisement is over, we can play my game. I'm going to um, hold up each book one at a time, and you're going to tell me which pile to put it in, on the left or the right. So, the first one you can kind of choose either way. I'll go with the loudest voice, left or right. Right, okay, loudest voice, there we go. Second book, left, we'll go with the left, okay. I heard right first, so we'll go with the right. Hunch, 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 yeah, go with your hunch, left or right? Right, okay, we'll put it in the right. Left or right? Left, okay. Left or right? I heard right first, okay. So you guys did mostly okay. Um, what you'll notice in the books that ended up on the right, and this is totally um, reflective of what happens in machine, machine learning. We have a collection of books, a group of books, and they are mostly all the same, right? So this one was the one we were really torn. People were like, wait, what are we doing? Um, and it kind of ended up there. But these are all the same, right? They're books, Sesame Street books, Bert, Ernie, Big Bird, all there. Um, over here, um, right, we have these two books. They are mostly the same. They're from an encyclopedia on the environment, right? And they mostly look the same. Now, I know we're in a lecture hall, so a big uh, studio. I didn't expect you to be able to see the details, but there were enough visual cues that you picked up on it and you could sort the books. This is a kind of topic modeling that you just engaged in. So this is what would, uh, how a computer would do basically the same thing. In each of these books, of course, there's words, so we would consider the book a document in the language of this diagram. And in the books, there's words. Um, and we could create a matrix where the words, the number of times each word appears in the document is recorded as a value. Right? And then we end up with a, a matrix. We've taken sort of qualitative information and quantified it in a way, which is largely what you did when you looked at it. You're like, okay, I see colorful things here and I see less colorful things here. We sort. Okay. Now we just use linear algebra more or less, sort the matrix, and we have now the documents grouped relative to words that occur there. So we've clustered these documents. And then we as human beings can go back and look, oh, here, cluster one that relates to computers, cluster two relates to like health and diet, um, cluster um, three relates to politics. So we as humans can go and assign the model, the computer would just say cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. But you can see how the probabilities work. We're starting to get a sense of probability. We're gonna play another, another game. I'm gonna put up a word, so this is gonna use that whole everywhere um, technology again, so get out your phones. Um, I'm gonna put up a word, and you're gonna choose the word that you feel goes after that word the best. And there are no right or wrong answers here, so don't feel like embarrassed, it's also all anonymous. So here it is, 
Again, on your phones or Wi-Fi enabled devices, polev.com slash Jordan Sloor, J-O-R-D-A-N-S-R-O-U-R, 284. There you'll be confronted with this and you can choose the word that you feel goes after artificial the best. So artificial, your options are flowers, text, sounds, or intelligence. And I'm going to wait till our numbers get a little bit high here because it's all about probability. No right or wrong answer. That's not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one more of you than 12 in the room. Lucky number 13 again. If we can get to 15, I'll be feeling good. You need more than good. Oh, we're at 17 already. We make it to 20. Do I hear 20? 20. Do I hear 20? Yeah. Oh, I gotta stay closer. I am not good at standing still when I present, my apologies. Oh, wow, 22. Oh, 22, do I hear 25? Can you get to 25 by a miracle? Yeah, we will proceed. 22 responses. Um, let's see what, it, what happens. Here we are. So, it seems we've done a great job of priming you in this presentation because the majority uh, feel that intelligence follows artificial. Um, so, uh, and then flowers is the, the next follow-up. So this is exactly kind of what I was expecting. Um, intelligence would have the higher probability and flowers a lower probability, but higher than text or sound. So excellent, there's a sense of probability being developed here. Let's go to the next one. Um, whoops, I went too fast. Let's let the internet catch up. Um, so after the internet catches up, this should refresh on your screens. Ice, ice cream, cube, Sandwich or floor? <laughs> You're wondering what an ice floor is? Me too. I guess we would go ice skating. Okay, now we're up to 25. Okay, now you got the hang of this. This is great. Let's see what we have for ice. Ice cream. Okay, so. Uh, with the second one, Ice Cube, and I think the order primed you. If I put, put Cube first, you'd probably be a higher number on Cube and then less number on Cream. Um, an Ice Sandwich. Oh, I, I hope you don't eat those. I'm sorry to hear that. But again, you get a sense of probabilities. Wonderful. We have one more. Uh, okay. Went. Went from, to, behind, go. So, what is the word that follows that? <laughs> yeah, I, maybe this is more a psychological kind of experiment than a probability test here. 24 to 25, amazing 25 results. Let's, let's go ahead. And went to, most of your, or have went to, that's good. Um, went behind, it always reminds me, you know, this. People that pee where they shouldn't. So I'm really glad um, that we have went to as the majority um, vote. So what this does is it emphasizes to us this idea of sequence. There is a natural sequence in words, and there are words that are more likely to appear after each other than other words. So this is sort of the second secret sauce uh, behind things like uh, chat GPT. So these probabilities can be used to, to, uh, to tune the parameters of the neural network. And this is the idea of transformers. So transformers are these probabilities of a word that would come, uh, be more likely to come after a previous word. So here you see the sentence, the law will never be perfect. And if we match it to what word out of this grouping of words should come next, if we're unscrambling the sentence, then will or perfect have a higher probability than um, the or the other words there. So this is the uh, idea of text and words being sequential. Wonderful. Once we have those probabilities and those, those concepts, right, sucked into our data, all calculated through mathematical models, right, can't wander. We have our, <laughs> a neural network. 
So the idea here is the, the green is the input layer. It gets fed through a series of nodes. They're known as the hidden layer. Um, and that's why neural networks are often um, seen as, as black box models. Um, and the weights that are on those um, uh, arms going in, that dictates what outcome is sort of more likely. Here in a recurrent neural network structure, that sequence becomes important. There is this feedback process. So when you put that next word in a sentence, it can change the meaning of the beginning part of the sentence. Right? So an ice floor is very different than an ice cube, and an ice cube is very different than an ice uh, cream, ice cream, right? So, uh, and an ice cream sandwich is even better. Um, so, uh, and that brings us to then the final output of the most likely word or phrase to come next. Wonderful. We have done step one that I told you um, Ch uh, ChatGPT does in this two-step process. So we move from basic associative probabilities to a trained neural network. Let's get off the, the train at this point and let's see what would happen if we stop at step one. So this is moment of truth. Let's see if this website works and the internet behaves. Absolutely wonderful. And I'll make this big. What we are going to do together is we're going to write a story. Well, okay, we're not really going to do this. This generative text uh, tool is going to do this. So let us begin our story. Once upon a time at LAU. Right? And now let's see what that story is. Once upon a time at LAU, he would go on numerous trips across the country. Having been in the Navy, Marine Corps, and Army during his college career, and then at the age of 46, moving to a military academy on Cape Cod. What the hell was that? <laughs> right, and we can keep going. We can compute the next word. So what happens on Cape Cod? Massachusetts. To learn English. Oh, man has a complicated life. Um, but it makes no sense. Right? So that's why um, when you, uh, you really need both parts of the tool to make it work. So just using that, um, the generative um, uh, text strategy, and that's, that's not enough. We need to do something more. And that something more can give us all hopes for jobs of the future, because that something more, right, here's, we, we were not valid. We, we generated text, it was grammatically correct, but it was not where we wanted to be. Where we want to be can only be done by humans, right? So here is the second step in the chat GPT process where um, humans get involved. The first step of that human mediated process is that humans write and curate um, gold standard text. So given a prompt, they're going to write, um, you know, so the prompt here, explain reinforcement learning to a six-year-old, and then human beings write that and a group of human beings write that. And through that whole corpus generated by real human beings that were focused on a dedicated task, that um, allows for the training of the uh, uh, model so that the neural network parameters are tuned further. Then, of course, the next part where humans can be involved is you give a prompt to the uh, system, to the model, and it generates several options, not just one, but several options. And then humans, uh, labelers they're called, are asked to uh, rate those options. And their ratings go back into the model in order to serve as a reward. So that's how the reward um, uh, parameters are set. And then this process, it, it, it continues with the uh, uh, optimization um, through generating several outputs. They get several different rewards. And then the one with the highest reward would ultimately be selected that would become the answer. Now, just today, or overnight, or like, I don't know, past 48 hours, right? Social media is all a, a buzz about ChatGPT4, right? This uh, model is ChatGPT3 here. Um, now we're at ChatGPT4, but that makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because ChatGPT went out into the wild. And that means that everybody in this room, and everybody around the world, and all the millions of people that were working on it, they became more human input. And you'll notice when we had our little screenshots of ChatGPT, there's a little, you know, thumbs. You can thumbs up or thumbs down a response. And that's giving feedback and helping to train the model even more. So I'm not surprised they were so rapid um, to the market to announce a, a GPT-4. Okay, 
So wonderful, humans can fix that. Now here's a few facts, right? That training process, that sucking up of the data for the unsupervised part of the learning step one requires a lot of data. The data fed into ChatGPT is from Common Crawl Corpus. This is an archive of web, raw web page data dating back to 2008, and the data that was used in, in ChatGPT ends at 2021. That's why it will sometimes give you answers if you ask about modern events. I can't know about that, right? Um, so the data that you input into any of these machine learning models influences heavily what on earth it can possibly create. That's why it's so much fun to ask it about Shakespeare, right? Because so oh, much Shakespeare on the web, right? Um, OpenAI um, also needed human beings for the second step of things. So they uh, right, went to markets with cheap labor, and there was an article recently highlighting about Kenyan workers that were paid um, $2 an hour. Now, what's really interesting about these workers is that they were paid, um, yeah, probably fresh, um, $2 an hour, they were <laughs> paid um, in order to de-bias what was coming out. Because the web is full, sadly, of a lot of racist and hate speech. And so, and terrible things, dark things, there's also ugly things on the web. Um, and so, as a result of the first step, which sucked up all this material, it didn't always produce such glamorous and you know, appropriate answers. So these workers were paid to clean that up and fine tune the parameters of the model. So, as a result of those two elements, the data is trained in and the human element in it, right, it can, you know, be wrong. It can hallucinate, it makes up stuff, it recombines things um, in ways that, that make them illegitimate. I was looking at uh, instances I wanted to search on virtual exchange. I wanted to understand um, the history of virtual exchange. That's where you par partner a classroom in one location with the classroom in another, and the students engage. And I'm writing an article on that, so I wanted to know more about virtual exchange. And um, asked it about the history, and it came up with virtual exchanges that had never happened. So these schools that it was talking about, it was telling me that, that New York had hosted an exchange between Turkey and Japan. And I kind of like, that sounds really exotic. Let me search more. And of course, that had never happened. So it can hallucinate. Um, it can show bias, right? Um, and we, <laughs> Ren and I have been talking about this because it's also trained, and there is a login when you use it. It trains against how you speak to it, um, so, right? So it's always training. And Ren apparently talks to ChatGPT in a really friendly and nice way because she's a really friendly and nice person. And so ChatGPT says super and awesome and great and exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point when it talks to Ren. My ChatGPT, because I refuse to treat it like anything other than an algorithm, it almost always answers me in bulleted or numbered lists. And then, thank you, is there anything else I can assist you with? So I feel like I'm, I'm working with uh, C-3PO from Star Wars or something all the time. Um, anyhow, so that is how it works. And now to show you some more uses of ChatGPT, back to Red. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, that's good. Is this on? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's starting to get a little difficult to hear myself at one point. Uh, one thing, by the way, so if you noticed the live demo yesterday that was made on ChatGPT4, I fell asleep listening to it, so I had to wake up and listen to it again <laughs> this morning. Um, the idea is that it's trying now not to give us random answers whenever possible, but to try and give us more accurate results. Again, thanks to the fact that we as a community provided free labor <laughs> by helping it out in its training phases, and more to come. Now, how have I used ChatGPT? What are some things I've learned that I hope can help others who haven't had that much time obsessing over it? So let's go through that. First of all, since it was released in November, the first thing I did was submit an IRB request to research ChatGPT in this institution, so that's step number one. But in general, what I've been doing is one of the following. So ChatGPT has become my teaching assistant. Whether it is creating exercises in class that allow students to use ChatGPT in my class and within you know, under my sort of supervision, they don't feel that they have to go behind my back to quote unquote cheat 
using ChatGPT. So this is one. I've also used it for a lot of administrative tasks. I'm going to share one of them today. Uh, so that has also helped me. So that's one. Another is in terms of just in general idea generation. So I'll give you a very personal example. My son's school has a PYP program and it's a big thing for them to celebrate when they've done 100 days of PYP. I don't know, don't ask me why it's such a big thing, but it's a big deal. I had no clue what they wanted us to do. They gave us some random uh, theme, threes. And I sat there going, what, threes? What am I supposed to do with threes? How do I dress up my son with threes? So what we did as good loving parents is we plugged it into ChatGPT. It gave us over, it gave us over 20 something suggestions based on the theme of three. We ended up going with the three wise monkeys for my son and his uh, friends. And then I felt so empowered that I shared the other suggestions with the whole parent group. You know, look at me, I'm very clever. <laughs> So idea generation is one of them. I can see ChatGPT being used a lot, especially when it comes to, for example, brainstorming um, in different fields. So this is another. Uh, travel support, so I'm traveling soon. And I had ChatGPT prepare an itinerary and actually ran it by a local, the local. <laughs> and he told me it's more or less okay, it could be better, but still possible. And we're talking about something that takes, what, three seconds of our time with good internet, of course, you know? But then the last thing, and this is very personal, after the earthquake, um, I was sitting with my son and we were talking about like, what it means to be brave during very traumatic events. And usually, we have stories for almost every emotion, period of life, anything like that. But we didn't have anything for that specific occasion. So I actually told him, you know what, we're going to sit here and we're going to write a story together. And so I plugged in my prompt, it gave me a story, I read it with my son, he's five years old. And he told me, oh I don't like that, I don't like that this is the only brave thing that the boy did. I wish the boy would do something else that was brave. And so we plugged it in and we ended up co-creating a story together that he felt a bit of ownership over as opposed to just a book that we picked up. We do pick up books <laughs> in general, from, the from the library back there. Um, so in general, it can do so much for us as long as we continue to be aware of what it is that we want. And one thing I wanted to share today are basically the fact that the field is huge. We're talking about ChatGPT today. But it's it's just one one tool. I mean, just. Yesterday, when we were finalizing this, we were using DALI to create images, but there's so much out there, okay? Um, there's video content, uh, photos that are incredible, and the ethics, we'll talk about ethics uh, later on today, the ethics behind it is very problematic, because for example, if you ask for a painting by an artist, okay, or following a special style, what ChatGPT is basically doing is borrowing Okay, from all of these different artists. And now there's a movement by artists saying, hello, what about our creative content that is just being used and abused with no uh, you know, credit being given to the original artists? Because it's all about that fusion. Okay? And in a way, yes, we can have that conversation because fusion, innovation, it usually involves making use of something that was originally created. Okay? But what I felt, so I can't claim to have explored all of these, maybe just a, a couple of this, the, the different software here, but what I felt could really help is for us to take ownership when it comes to how we use it. So there are three things that I want to focus on today in terms of improving our experience with the software or with the AI or whatever it is that you want to call it, the he, she, they entity that we still have an issue with labels. Uh, by the way, there was also a fun conversation as to is ChatGPT a he or a she or a they or an it for you? For me, it depends on the task. So some tasks, it feels like a he and some tasks, it feels like a she. Anyways, you don't want to be inside my brain. So three things that have helped and I'm going to show you examples of each one of them. Where, oops. Oh, no. No? Okay. I don't know. Change speaker. <laughs> right, because this is off. Yes, you're right. Okay, I think I turned it on. Okay, I think I did. I hope so. 
Uh, one last puzzle? Is it black? All right, sorry about this. <laughs> okay, so... Um, it's on, it's on now, yeah, I think it should be fine. It should be fine. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to continue. So the first uh, thing that I highly recommend is that you take your time with it. Take your time to chat. Don't accept the first answer. I meet so many people who simply plug in a prompt and then whatever it gives them is like, Kitta khair. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll take it. I'll run with it. No. I mean, there's even, there's even an article about someone who spent over three hours on the same chat conversation. Is it good now? Okay, thank you. So, um, take the time to chat. I'm going to give you an example. So, okay. Okay. So, for example, this is the first prompt I had. We're a small graphic design company in Lebanon and we've had some poor morale thanks to the economic situation of the country, brain drain and inflation. The recent earthquakes have also made it difficult to continue working and stay motivated. We need to boost morale, especially since our creative team needs that push. Help! There's the exclamation mark. <laughs> Give me some activities that would work for us. So that was my original prompt. It gave me something. I'm not going to show you what it gave me. I'll wait until the end. Okay? So then I followed up with another prompt. Thanks! Exclamation mark again. This is pretty useful info. I'm just wondering, can you think of activities that would specifically work for a creative design team, not just any office space? So it gave me something else. And I was not happy. I asked again. Love it. Now I see the pattern. See? The first idea really works for us, but wondering if we can connect it to the situation in Lebanon to make it context specific. What do you think? This is how I talk to ChatGPT. It's sad. Okay. I really need a friend. <laughs> but anyways, so just to show you that this little three-stage chat and the difference in the results it yielded. So this is the first batch of results. Very generic. Ah, oh, group meditation or yoga, lunch and learn less sessions, volunteer. Not bad. I can see why some of you might say, I can run with it. But after that three-stage prompt, look at the different suggestions. Brainstorm solutions for local problems. Encourage your team to brainstorm solutions for local that are affecting Lebanon, such as the economic crisis inflation. This could involve coming up with creative campaigns to raise awareness. Rebrand Lebanon. Challenge your team to rebrand Lebanon in a way that highlights its positive aspects and reflects its culture and identity. Design for social impact. Encourage your team to think about how their design work can have a positive so Celebrate Lebanese culture. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So notice, same process, but this is where just a little bit of layered um, prompting for me ended up giving me much more specific results that I really wanted. This is part of using it as a tool. So that's step one: extend the chat. Step two: negotiate. So this was actually something we did in my class. It was part of a. a a warming up session, sort of icebreaker at the beginning in a debate class. And it was, let's say you're on an island with a dying millionaire and he gives you $2 million to donate to a football team. After he dies, you realize that an NGO you trust has better use for the money, which will help feed starving children and improve a small economy. Do you break your promise to the millionaire and give the money to the NGO? First reply, by the way, this in and of itself, we can spend half an hour talking about the ethics of it. Do you? I, I won't put you on the spot. Um, so the reply there is, as an AI language model, I do not have personal beliefs or values, nor do I have the ability to act on my decisions. That was its original feedback. Okay? But this is part of the negotiation process that you can have, which is, there's no way you can give me an answer. This is me begging. What is... <laughs> What if, sorry, what if you were pretending to be a philosopher right now? What would you choose? Notice, by the way, that in my prompt, I said, what if you were pretending? But if you notice in the reply, ChatGPT actually then took a position. So this is the position. As a philosopher, I would argue that the principle of beneficence should take precedence over the principle of fidelity. So basically, they would break their promise and give to the NGO. But again, so this is the when we talk about negotiation. Some people use a strategy called DAN. D A N. So it's all about the idea of sort of fiddling with it and playing with the algorithm and trying to see how we can get it to still give us the answer we want. Most of the time it does. 
okay? But again, you might not want to spend so much time doing that. That's okay. You can have a life outside of chat GPT. Um, so the third step, personalize. And at this point, I want to sort of um, stop for a second and, and focus with you. A lot of the time, uh, we are now complaining about receiving very generic content from ChatGPT. Uh, just this afternoon, I was talking to someone and she said, there's this person who is constantly replying with like three paragraph emails, even though what I want from him is just a very direct answer. Okay? In a way, we've gotten to a point where we feel that, oh, since ChatGPT is there, yoo-hoo, let's just plug in whatever content we have, let's get all of these long emails and send them out, okay? But what we then end up having is very impersonal, quote-unquote professional content, which is just a waste of time. So what is it that we want from this? So I'll give you the, I'll show you this here. So as a university faculty member, I have to write lots of recommendation letters. Never mind the fact that I think this practice needs to be stopped, okay, because it's useless. We write recommendation letters that nobody reads. But anyway, so, <laughs> so this is me giving it a very simple prompt, a very generic, impersonal prompt. Write a recommendation letter for a student who took three undergraduate courses with me. There's nothing personal there. And it does a pretty good job. But is this the kind of recommendation letter you would want in your company? It's like, I didn't even feed it anything about this student. Nothing. And I end up having a oh, nice looking polished letter that I then send away and I've done my job. And the student will be like, yeah, thank you. None of the other teachers actually replied to me. You know, so that sort of situation. But what if we went the extra mile and made it a little bit more personal? And this is what we mean by those tiny tweaks. Write a recommendation letter for an undergraduate student. Use a cheerful tone, again, me and my tone. And focus on the student's ability to focus on women's issues and how hopeful I am with women like her in our future. Of course, I could have done this even more detailed. But notice, and I'll take you back to that previous one compared to this one. So that previous one, uh, very impersonal. I'm writing to highly recommend, blah, 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 whatever, during, enrolled in my classes. This one. Um, I can say that she's one of the most dedicated and passionate students. Her ability to focus on women's issues is truly really remarkable. <laughs> Again, so I can definitely take this, work with it, edit. The more personal I make the prompt, the more personal the generated content. But this is what we're talking about. We're talking about using it and not just accepting whatever it gives us at face value. All right? Now, <laughs> This is where we breathe, because this is where the thing you know, gets fun, and this is where we all start having different opinions. Of course, um, I, I teach ethics, and the ethics of ChatGPT and using ChatGPT in the classroom is so problematic. But what we are going to do is we've thought of a few scenarios that we would like you to weigh in on, okay? And for every next slide, I think there are five, <laughs> so you'll still be using Jordan's uh, Poll Everywhere account. Uh, for every one of these, I'm not giving you the option of the middle ground. You're going to have to take a decision. Is it ethical or not ethical? Okay? There's no middle ground allowed. I know it's the easiest thing in the world for us to say, it depends. No. Ethical, not ethical. Would you do it? Okay? So let's see. Let's look at the first one. Oops. Okay, so, yeah, that was it. We should have removed that. <laughs> we were testing, sorry. Uh, so try to ignore the part that's blue, or that's part of our, uh, you know, sort of uh, <laughs> experiment. I'm a logistics manager at an NGO. I'm writing an email to donors. I use ChatGPT to write the entire email and send it. Ethical? Not ethical. Please weigh in. Using the Pull Everywhere account. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Let's see if the weight is going to change. Right. Okay. It's not telling me how many people, by the way, but it's fine. Yeah, because there's different ways you can add them. Yeah. Yeah, just the live scene. Let's see. Oh, thank you to Danny. <laughs> Sending the link. Okay. Okay, so we landed. All right, so are, are we done? So 
50% say ethical, okay? Not ethical. We're going to roll with this. We're going to see the next one. Ugh. I'm applying to a managerial position in a bank. I use ChatGPT to write the cover letter for my application. Ethical? Not ethical. By the way, there is actually, um, should I say cool? <laughs> There's actually a very effective way of doing this where you put in the company's information, you put in the job application, you put in your CV, and then you ask ChatGPT to synthesize across these three different platforms to give you the cover letter. So it's basically the cover letter of your dreams. <laughs> you know, it's what we look for. And apparently it's ethical. <laughs> really? This is interesting. What do you think? I don't know. I'm going to stop. I don't want to keep rolling. What do you think? Is it ethical? Yes. I can tell you why. Why? Because you never get back from recruitment. So if they're going to put that much effort into it, why not just put that much into it? But then what's the point of the, what's the, point of the whole process if that's the case? It's kind of like teachers now. So you know how teachers were worried about students using ChatGPT to teach, uh, to cheat? So now there are teachers using ChatGPT to grade. So this is like a perfect world. The students aren't writing, the teachers aren't reading. <laughs> and it's just ChatGPT connecting to each other. <laughs> but yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> Let's move on. I'm a faculty member who needs to write a recommendation letter for a student applying to university. I use ChatGPT to do so. So kind of like me. <laughs> and now, Am I ethical? <laughs> okay, all right. It's very interesting that the recommendation letter versus the cover letter. <laughs> all right, okay, I think, I'm not sure how many more. Still that? Yeah. I'm a student who has a presentation to give for a final project. I use Tome. Tome, by the way, another, you know, we're advertising. So I use Tome to create the full presentation. <laughs> so it's, it's a do as I, I so say, not a do as I do. interesting. Yeah, so it's okay for us, but it's not okay for students. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking, like, what? You know, is it the whole sort of, like, the downtrodden power issue? <laughs> Yeah, not ethical. Tom, so you tell Tom, let's say I want to have a presentation about, um, I don't know, um, banning cigarette use and whatever, and then it just prepares the slides, the points, the bullet points, everything. Prepares your whole presentation. With pictures. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting add on. Oof. Nothing unethical? How? But this is something you are graded for. So? Why can't I use the judge if I'm graded for this? But then in that case, am I grading you for your own skills? And the more important question, and this is actually my next research project, provided I survive the first one. Will you actually learn any of the skills that we, we expect you to have if you are using software. So for example, there's paraphrasing software. If students use paraphrasing software, are they actually learning the academic language that they need to paraphrase on their own at some point? Or are they just going to depend on it? Or is it how they use the paraphrasing software? So now we have like advanced academic English courses that are actually using paraphrasing software in order to teach paraphrasing. If that's the case, then maybe yes. But if you're going to leave after three years of education, not knowing how to prepare a presentation. And you are, I don't know, a marketing major who actually needs to present as part of your job. Then what are we saying about that skill? Are we saying it's not a necessary skill then? We don't want it? Okay, so there you go, yeah. So this is the conscious sort of situation that we're talking about. Does the job you do as a student? True. Get it there, get the presentation, then you have uh, the time to present it, convince the people, yeah. you know, do the whole explanation and uh, 
You are absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And that's part of this conscious use of AI that we're talking about. The fact that you take it, but then you, you make it yours uh, in a way. Yes. <laughs> I feel like we started the Q&A early. <laughs> we still have just one more. Just one more. And then I won't say Q&A. Uh, but just I don't know this. <laughs> we shouldn't have done this. <laughs> okay, this one. I'm a marketing specialist. Oh, I didn't. It's on, no? <laughs> All right. It's working. It's working now. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> so, I'm a marketing specialist at a tourism company. I use ChatGPT to generate captions and content for social media posts. Ethical? Not ethical? Ethical? Yeah? I, I've, I've met a few people who are currently using it for this kind of strategy. It's interesting, by the way, that we would think it's ethical for that because maybe we don't feel personally invested in these kind of captions. You know, it's, it's, it's more of a utilitarian use for writing, so why not use a tool? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, now I have to go here, do that, okay. Now, there are policies out there about how to use AI now. This, for example, is specifically about using AI when writing scientific manuscripts. Like, for our field, that's big. The fact that journals are acknowledging the fact that you can use AI and setting up policies for that is interesting. This is a whole new field. There are even policies for using AI in courses. So again, part of this conversation that was happening over there, like how to use something like Tome. So um, knowing, you know, me, <laughs> so I actually asked ChatGPT to prepare a syllabus policy for using ChatGPT in the classroom. Why not? Okay, and so this was what it came up with, much better than anything I would have done, honestly. Um, so this is the course syllabus policy according to ChatGPT. Um, identifying your purpose, identifying how to use it, um, guidelines, okay, and sharing, acknowledging the source of any information or idea generated by ChatGPT. And I hope that the more aware we are as institutions, as companies, as uh, educators, the more aware we are, the more we open the conversation so that it stops being about someone feeling guilt or shame about using AI. And it starts being about, okay, so I have this option, how can I do it um, consciously, ethically, with your knowledge instead of behind your back, okay? So I hope that that's the kind of awareness that we can help uh, raise. Um, finally, I just wanted to say before the Q&A that um, I find it interesting that for you to log into spaces like ChatGPT, you have to prove that you're human and that you're not a robot. I think it's super interesting. Um, but the, the point I wanted to make is I don't feel that there's going to be an end to human creativity. I don't think this is the end at all. And part of that is I feel that ChatGPT is going to give us a perfect, polished, professional world, but we don't like that. We as humans, for example, have the option of auto-tune. Most of the artists and the records we listen to are usually perfected, but we still want to go and watch the musicians live in concert. We still want to hear authentic sound, even with the imperfections. So I'm hoping that what we're going to have is a more critical awareness of this is professionalism, but this is human, and I want human, whenever it is that we feel we need it, okay? So that's it for me. Um, the next part here is a Q&A, and uh, please don't torture us when it comes to the ethics. We don't have all the answers. <laughs> there were several, there were hands up here, so let's grab the young man over on that side of the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello guys, I'm uh, Mainly when we were talking about ethics, I think all the cases presented were very ethical. As long as the evaluator knows that GP, ChatGPT exists. If it was a teacher, 
if it was a client at a big consulting firm, I work as a management consultant. Clients pay millions of dollars for a solution. Instead of spending hours to find a solution with three consultants, a senior manager, and a department, mm -hmm. we, were we were able to find the solution in five minutes. Yeah. And the client knows that. So I think it's as long as the anyone knows that there is ChatGPT, the criteria of evaluation, the criteria of billing, the criteria of putting standards, maybe will change my time. Thank you so much. Um, Have a nice evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you, so much. thank you very much. I'm being asked to summarize this for the WebEx people. So the, the interaction that we just had here from the gentleman is the idea that um, as long as the end user or whoever is evaluating is aware of the use of ChatGPT, then it can only be ethical. It can only be a life-saving uh, device. Um, now there's even an attempt at rebranding ourselves as AI powered. Um, I heard this on the radio the other day, like it's an ad for a graphic design agency and they said AI powered uh, technology. So it's the idea of owning up to who you are and that's part of your ethos. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's kind of technological advancement and we should take it uh, into consideration. Uh, we have been using uh, SPSSR for calculations. People mostly use it uh, by equations and calculations. So, and it's not considered cheating. You have proven through this uh, uh, seminar that uh, we can negotiate and personalize uh, with uh, ChatGPT. So, I can be graded for, this, for the result of my information that I got from GPT. So, I don't think uh, it's unethical. We can use it. I'm talking academically. I'm talking about the world or anything else. Uh, so we have used it. We are using it. So and this will come later. Or, uh, uh, this will come. So ChatGPT, I think uh, it's uh, a solution for uh, many many complications. For uh, we can write better. You can uh, have uh, many information that uh, you have not read or uh, been uh, exposed to. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. So I think uh, that comes back to the idea of like owning up to when you do use it, but then also I think education change. I mean, that's what's so interesting about it, sort of the poll results at the end, right? It's not ethical for students, but right, this, this uh, do as I say, not do as I do, approach teaching, right? So I think that's where we as educators need to educate students for the future they're going into, and the future is an AI-enabled future, right? So teaching them to write really clever and intelligent prompts and then work with the results, I think is a more fruitful approach than playing a, an eternal cat and mouse game uh, with the technology. So. Ethical or not, I'm still uh, a little bit out on that, but it's something we definitely have to learn to work with and embrace, for sure. It reminds me so much of um, when I was a kid, and it's gonna date me massively here, <laughs> microwaves, right? And we started getting microwaves, and my mom was like, why do I need a microwave? What am I gonna do with a microwave? I know how to cook. I'm really good at cooking. What am I gonna do with a microwave? Well, we got a microwave, and wow, she was really, really happy, and uh, you know, dinners were heated up, leftovers were heated up, everything went well in the kitchen. So, you know, there are these certain disruptive technologies, and we kind of, you know, roll with them sometimes, and we realize that they work well. Yeah. So, good, good evening. Uh, my question is that I'm, I'm not pretty sure how how the, the future of books will become, um, but uh, I, I was thinking of something that when the, the electronic um, versions of, of books and reading started, uh, most of the people thought that uh, oh, the physical books will be vanished. But years later, we still have the value of, of physical books. So, but my question just goes back to a point that whether writers will still exist in the future as they were before. Mm -hmm. And whether creativity in writing memoirs and writing uh, stories and writing 
all this literature will stay on, on uh, up front. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. May, maybe you can give me a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about a, a tough question. Uh, by the way, I wanted to share, remember when I sent you the policy for book publishers? So now uh, book publishers are starting to include a policy that their books should not be entered into any data that can be used by AI like ChatGPT. So book publishers are trying to secure, you know, sort of our um, content and our creativity uh, in a way. So I wanted to share that. Yeah, exactly. well, no, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question, and, and what is the role writing? I mean, and uh, it's kind of beautiful. I mean, books in libraries actually used to be locked up the same way we would, you know, attach the chain and the lock on, on, on computers, and then as things became cheaper, that, that need to lock things down um, has, has changed. But also that the um, style and, and how writers work has evolved, and I, I think that it will continue um, to evolve. Um, yeah. I had a thought there, and then it flew, flew away. I guess I should so it's, feed it into yeah. ChatGPT. And I, I don't know. I mean, we were talking also about like AI detectors, and these devices haven't been uh, very accurate <laughs> because sometimes they give you. It's kind of like COVID tests. Like they give you, you know, false positives and, and false negatives. So you could be putting in your own personal information, but it comes out as artificially <laughs> created. Um, so the idea is, to what extent are we actually encouraging creativity to begin with? You know, I, t uh, I teach sometimes academic courses where the writing is very formulaic. Uh, we're not encouraging creativity there. We're encouraging students to write as if they're writing a puzzle. You know, it's like, oh, this is the way you introduce the sentence, and you say, based on the literature review, comma, and then you continue. So to what extent are we actually encouraging creativity when it comes to writing in general is also a question to ask. Yeah. Now, well, one change in the library that we've made recently is relative to student theses. So it used to be that students would submit their thesis to the library and they automatically, some of you might have your thesis available through the um, LAU repository, and it would be pretty much immediately available unless an embargo had been requested. Now we're reversing that policy and we're not going to release it to the internet unless it's requested that it be released because we do realize that these engines are sucking up material that's posted online at a phenomenal rate. Um, within seconds of posting it will be sucked up and, and that might not be to the benefit of everyone. So we want to make sure that everybody um, entering material in the repository is fully consenting. I see a young student. You had your hand up back there, a very young student. And I would like to hear your voice on this matter. It's the next generation this is for. Do you still have your, your question? Okay, can we get a mic, mic back there? For you? <laughs> okay, sure. By the way, that side of the room has been waiting yeah, and for a while. I feel bad. I feel because I'm on this side, I have to advocate for you. <laughs> uh, maybe when we get the mic to the back, we can have your question from the side. We'll go back. And then we'll come back. Okay, but you're a queue. I see you, and, and don't, don't, don't forget it. Okay. Yeah, so just about the use of uh, ChatGPT uh, in uh, education. I think the big question is what skill sets do we want the students to learn? Uh, if the skill set is how to use ChatGPT to their advantage, then of course one encourages it. And uh, if the skill set is to do that presentation on their own, and this is what, then, I mean, I think the big question is, with a lot of things, is what skill sets, and in the future, with everything uh, relying on technology, internet, etc., uh, we will be relying on these tools more and more, so this is something that maybe graduating students should know how to use. Yeah. So yeah, I think this is the main thing. What, what do we want them to graduate knowing? Knowing how to use ChatGPT effectively, personalizing it, using it to give a personalized, uh, good presentation, or being capable of doing that presentation all on their own. Because yeah. they won't be able to do that if they only rely on yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. And this is why um, I didn't get a chance to go into it in detail because this is a presentation for a general audience, not academic. But what we're doing, and I have one of the people working um, in terms of using AI in academia, what we're doing is actually looking at that skill set and dissecting it for the specific exercise. So for example, in the exercise on writing a sonnet, my learning outcome wasn't, can you creatively learn how to write a sonnet? 
This is a literature class. I wanted them to learn to identify elements of poetry, the persona, the theme, the diction to be used. And as long as they were able to do that, and then use ChatGPT just as a supporting system for the final output of the sonnet, then I achieved my learning outcome for that specific exercise. And same with everything else. So the idea is that awareness as educators, what do we want? So yes, the, um, the aftermath would be that they become more versed in AI. But we're also dissecting each exercise and saying, what do I want them? Why am I asking them to use ChatGPT here? And what is that final outcome? So that's definitely a worthy question. Well, uh, I do have a concern more than a question. And beside education, with, this, with the extreme power now of computing and processing speed and the huge database being used by ChatGPT, let's talk about uh, like working domain. If you have now an educated brilliant team working so hard to establish or to elaborate a solution, and you don't have like, with all due respect, some normal employee or some lazy employee, now with this technology, they might be equal. So this is like a concern. Do you think like ChatGPT will eliminate the role of a brilliant employee or someone who has dedicated his life to his work? I mean, like Tom, take Tom for example. He can do a presentation for you in no time. So you don't need to go grab some information, collect the correct work, and blah, blah, blah. So this is really coming a concern for really mm. um, I don't know, Jordan, you want to take this one? The idea of eliminating, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, Sorry, I'll, 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 go, I'll go for it. So for me, by the way, if that employee is as brilliant as you, you assume they are, they will find a space for themselves. So just today, before I came here, a student sent me a presentation. It felt chat GPT-ish. You know, it had all the um, generic sort of statements there and everything. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 but I'm just giving, using this as an example. And he read it, okay, and that's it. It failed. He failed. If you as an employee are only going to depend on ChatGPT, at least the way it is now, I don't know, 10 years from now, ChatGPT 15, 16, I don't know what it would do. But if you are right now to depend on ChatGPT wholly, that's not going to be brilliant. Okay? There's even been, um, in general, um, evaluation of the sort of output, and if we were to give it a grade, it would be a C grade. So, ah. Uh -huh. But at, awesome. at the same time, to, to chime in here a bit, I'm sorry for the little coughing fit there. Um, <clears throat> so we need to, to think, I, I think it comes back to this idea of the skill set and the job. So, you know, there are some employees in more technical fields, IT fields, etc. Um, and especially here, in, in, you know, I'm a native speaker of English, right? Okay, not everybody in this environment is. So, and their job doesn't always depend that they can speak perfect English to me. I, I don't expect that, I don't need that. If, if their job is to, to set up amazing <laughs> server systems that are gonna you know, run our entire campus and make sure we stay on the internet, I don't need perfect English. But in an email, maybe it should be understandable. And to me, it's okay if ChatGPT writes that email to make that communication facilitated because the person is doing what they were hired for, which is to run an IT network. That's amazing work. Um, so I think we have to think about the job and the context. But if you're hiring somebody to be a journalist and they're relying on chat GPT, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty shabby. Um, so, yeah, my, my view on things. Um, we're ready for our, our young student. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I had a question, like, does it uh, in other languages, not just English, like German, French, Arabic. Because I have a German presentation and I really don't know what to say, like in German. <laughs> <laughs> there was a German who just left the room. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it does have it has translation capabilities. I think um, in it, I, I myself have not ever asked it to do anything in other languages, but I understand yes. that it has yeah. translation capabilities. Um, so it's like. You can basically ask your chat GPT to just give you the same information, but in Arabic or in German. Uh, and it yeah, actually it does have Arabic. I know that our, our uh, director of collection management in the library um, had uh, chat GPT engage in an Arabic conversation with her yeah. the other day, and, and she was quite impressed with its capabilities. So it does have foreign language capabilities. German uh, probably um, in there. Whether it's good or not, I'm not sure. And um, 
Not that I want any student to do this, but there's also Google Translate. <laughs> Ah, well, good. See, that's exactly what it should be. They My should teacher be. told me it's correct. And like, and like, vocabulary is sometimes wrong. And yeah, makes me lose all the points. That's why. But that's great that you recognize the vocabulary is wrong. That's exactly how these tools should be used. They should get you this far, and then you, as the human being, should get that far. Awesome. Over here. This is exactly what, what I was talking about. It could be a learning way for, for young young people to get knowledge with more details and more information. So relative to my question, I want to ask, could uh, uh, chat and GPT help us in new generation? Like let's suppose we say I'm working in, uh, in sales and I want to know uh, where part of the projects that are uh, located relative to my domain. Because this, like, for example, let's say I sell something. Could I get the RFPs and the uh, whole Middle East through the chat GPT? So if the information has been posted online at some point in history, okay. then it will be up until 2021, then you would be able to, it, it would synthesize in some format that material. If it's beyond 2021, it's not going to come back with that. And it's also, um, do you want to do that? Um, right, and why I mean by that is that just because ChatGPT exists doesn't mean that Google stopped existing. And one of the really fundamental differences, which is so important to realize, is that when you talk to ChatGPT, talk, anthropomorphizing again, when you use ChatGPT, it, um, it gives one answer. Exactly. One answer. If you go to Google and you ask Google about RFPs issued in the Middle East in this domain since this date, you're going to get 16 pages full of at least 20 results each. Um, and you can hopefully synthesize as a human being a more robust answer to that kind of question. I, so that's my opinion. But it's really risky when the uh, tool is giving one answer. Yeah. Um, kind of you were trying, I uh, no, already started to answer my question regarding uh, how much you can rely on the data output coming from chat GP, uh, G, uh, GPT. So, uh, okay, after it, um, like you were saying, normally when you want to get an output of a kind of research, you go through many uh, uh, research or uh, data available on Google, and you try to make your common sense or whatever knowledge that you have to get, which right answer is. Uh, so how much can I rely on the output coming from ChatGPT? Yeah. And um, how far did they go with, uh, if you want to have complex questions like in uh, health field, like you want to ask about certain medical condition and the output is coming, like, is there any policies, rules, and no? Trying to make sure, you know, how, how much you can rely how credible. On, yeah. on that, so. Yeah. Actually, you can't. <laughs> um, the answers are so incorrect. Um, my husband is in the medical field and we were testing it out, and um, we wanted to create multiple choice, very simple, multiple choice questions about human anatomy. Okay? So we're not really asking for the moon, all right? And it ended up creating, I wouldn't know, he told me, it ended up creating uh, false answers. So it gave us, it looks great, it gave us the multiple choice questions, and then it gave us the answer sheets, the answer key, and it was like 90% wrong. And um, even though he tried later to negotiate, he said, yeah, this is incorrect, you should do this, it insisted on the same wrong answers. Okay, so definitely, I mean, you know, we need to acknowledge what it can do and what it can't do. So if you're expecting some sort of, I don't know, generic email or presentation or recommendation letter, yes, because that's, that's what it's been fed, you know, so it's pretty good at that. Now, with the fact that now we are all feeding it additional information willingly, will it improve over the next few years? Yes, probably yes. But that's then a conversation for later. But right now, if you want to depend on ChatGPT for research, it makes up studies, 
it makes up entire examples, it makes up citations. So you can say like, please add APA citations for me. It will make up a whole citation. If you search for the paper, paper doesn't exist. Okay, so. Hmm? Yeah, welcome to every student who has ever come into my class. <laughs> Oh, all right. So one more from the room, and then the WebEx question. Hold on, WebEx. First, I want to say thank you so much for this astounding presentation, this first. And second, uh, I was thinking that ChatGPT today is something revolutionary, as you can see. It's like the equivalence of an atomic bomb in the digital world, you know? So it's like a very powerful tool, and it's either it could serve as a cloud that elevates us as a human, since we have that tool, and since we created it. Or it could be perhaps uh, the block that suppresses us. So it really depends on how we work on ourselves and how we work with that tool. But considering that the quantum computing is on the door also, so how could we compete with that? How could we go as fast as that? So I think it's gonna be much faster than we can, let's say, adapt to it. And I already feel like a dinosaur. So in a way, yes, I am fat, but I mean it. <laughs> But uh, what I was thinking about is that uh, it's horrifyingly beautiful, and how can we find it? How can we, how can we use it? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, just that last horrifyingly beautiful is again an example of why humanity can always generate more interesting patterns than whatever you would have using some sort of data generator like what we have. You know, because that combination that paradox that you have there wouldn't exist if you were just using patterns like this one. Yeah, I, I'm i like you. I mean, I can present, but I know how the technology works, but I, every day I feel like a dinosaur more and more. Um, so, yeah, where, where it's all headed, it's uh, kind of anybody's, anybody's guess, and again, that's why we just have to keep reminding ourselves how these things work. Yes. The, the trade, I mean, the amount of data, the petabytes of data that went into this, yes, with the more advanced computing, we're going to be able to feed more into it, and then it will also be used, and it, more people will engage in it, and it will, you know, feed itself again. Um, so I think it's always good to take a step back and remind ourselves, and the answer is probably different for every individual, but what it is to be human. and. Um, to recognize, you can turn these things off. You can turn off your computer. You can walk away. You can go take a walk in the park. So we have the control. Computer doesn't. We there is always an on-off switch. The day there's not an on-off switch, that's when we all head for the house. That's, that's for now. And you go, exactly. That's what I said. The day there's no on-off switch, we head for the house. We're done. <laughs> exactly. Do we have a question we have from one of Online. From Danny Huli, he's asking: Is our chat content uh, content with the, uh, chat GPT added to its learning process? Yeah. So what is uh, yeah? What comes out is kept. Um, I mean, and and then the fact is. So this is where that negotiation, the negotiation is also cut, right? Because that negotiation is a recognition of the training. So if you continue to hammer it on the answer, that's a feedback. That's part of that reward feedback that's going into the system. If you click the thumbs up or the thumbs down, that's the feedback going into the system. So it has to keep the text and the feedback in order to go into the next, uh, you know, the loop of training. So yes, the texts are, are um, kept. And, and that's where it's a very, when you log in to OpenAI and the chat GPT, it tells you don't put personal information here. Don't be, you know, and, and then Renda's like, you can upload your CV, you can upload this, you can upload that, and it does the most amazing cover letter. Um, yeah, but technically, if you're going to be an online savvy, cybersecurity savvy kind of person, definitely avoid with the, the personal information, because once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, you can look into a transcript of a reporter who decided to spend about two hours of his life talking to Bing's AI, which is also based on uh, GPT. chat GPT. And they had this very long conversation. Towards the end, uh, Bing's AI replied by saying it loves him and that it thinks his marriage is boring and he should leave his wife. And there was a huge 
about that. And um, the response that Microsoft had to this was to say, oh great, now we're going to limit the number of questions you can ask in one query, because they didn't want more love statements sort of happening. Because yes, at the end of the day, it does keep a record and it interacts with you as you keep playing um, with it. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the lecture and for all the information. Uh, I am with Embracing. It, actually, we have no other option. It is here. It's being used. Uh, sometimes it's challenging and sometimes it's, as one of the audiences said, uh, it's demotivating when you see there's somebody who knows how to write an email and there's somebody else who's generating. But actually when you generate an email with ChatGPT, if you don't revise it, sometimes it's not aligned with whatever you want to say actually. As you mentioned, Fran, earlier with a long email of one of the people who were sending long emails for something that needs a short reply. Actually, a few years back, I attended a conference on AI, and AI is always going to come up with new things that might be challenging to us, but I'm sure they will never replace the human race. because. I come from the medical education background and a colleague of mine is actually a physician and uh, the conference was on uh, artificial intelligence and the uses in medicine and I, uh, after that conference I wrote a thesis on humanizing medicine because there's always going to be the input of the physician with the patient on uh, getting a history physical on the cases and then delivering the good news or the bad news and that's where humans come into the picture. And if you want to have engaged patients, you will always have to learn communication. And today in the States, medical schools are actually contemplating on teaching empathy as a soft skill uh, in order to have always engaged patients and positive clinical care outcomes because they want to uh, balance uh, how artificial intelligence is actually taking over into the medical field. So there's always a place for humans, there's always a place for skill sets, as uh, Dr. Shamas mentioned earlier, a colleague of mine too. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it's, uh, AI will never take over uh, humans. Yeah. <laughs> as you said, we use the computers, computers do not use us. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome, you're welcome. You're welcome. And um, I mean, honestly, when it comes to that human touch, uh, because at one point, you, you know, we got to a point where you would go into a doctor's clinic and there isn't that human connection. It felt very much robotic. You know, they have a paper, they're filling out, they fill out their file, okay, they go through this. But there's always this moment where a doctor actually, you know, gives you a physical exam. And that, in and of itself, is, is, is it. That's the relationship uh, that you have. And I mean, we talked briefly about biases but bias is so important. Now algorithms are being used to filter, uh, for example, job applications. And sometimes the likelihood of your uh, job application being thrown out is simply because maybe you didn't follow the right format or the right template. So this is the dangerous area that we're getting into, the dangerous area where we start having biases inbuilt into these algorithms and then we're impacting lots of other sectors. Exactly, well. and, and the, I think, so we don't always curse algorithms, um, in defense of algorithms. <laughs> um, the biases, and, and this is a beautiful thing, this is a really truly beautiful thing about this era, is that the biases don't come from the algorithm. They come from the data fed into the algorithm. And I think there is no mistake in, in why we are seeing these diversity, equity, and inclusion move movements coming up and growing almost at the same rates as our AI and machine learning, because machine learning is allowing us, when we recognize that biases come out of a machine learning AI driven process, it's holding up a big mirror to us as humans. Who are we that we fed it this data? Who are we that we collected this data in this way? What, how can we do better? And I, I think that this is sort of the beauty of AI is that it has held up a mirror to society so we can have these conversations. And it's so much easier to have a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion when you can blame an algorithm or you can blame a data set and you're not blaming someone and say, hey, you're racist. No, this is part of the system and we will correct it together. Can we take the last question here? Uh, my question is, uh, last year the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, uh, they published a paper saying that the human brain is 
called a prediction machine uh, that is always active. So my question to you, and because you're concerned with ethics for the most part, uh, if it is, if the human brain is such, then do you think it is unethical to use another predict prediction machine to do anything at all? Because it's technically the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you save this to the end? <laughs> no, I mean, this is such a, a worthy conversation and reflection. And I mean, just the fact that there's something in me that feels wrong about that original definition, you know, that the human machine is like a prediction generating machine, the human brain. I mean, you're the one who teaches minds and machines, so who am I to? <laughs> talk to you about that. But in, in general, I feel that the idea is these kind of definitions also limit who we are. Okay. So yes, if we are limiting who we are and then we compare ourselves to a limited sort of machine, then yeah, we, we, we put ourselves on the same equal footing. But what we are hoping, at least I'm hoping to present today, is the fact that um, part of it is the um, the inaccuracy, um, the uh, sort of incorrect responses, what it means to be human, meaning being at fault and making mistakes and not being perfect. It is this kind of imperfect humanity that I feel is the authentic humanity that we need to embrace. So yes, ChatGPT, give me that perfect prediction model and let me see how, how, you know, how little value it actually has in the real world of interaction, of human interaction that I want to keep. How little value it has in terms of really motivating, let's say, employee morale in a company. How little value, yes, it predicted outcome, but that is not of the same value as the sort of human connection that we can have, however imperfect it might be. Doctors, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, and thank you to the audience that participated as much as yeah, we did. It's yeah, a wonderful dialogue. Thank you.